Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Paul Barber. Our top stories. Iran targets Israel firing hundreds of drones and missiles. Israel says the confrontation is not over yet. Celebrations in Tehran, but anxiety in the West. World leaders urge restraint in the face of a rapidly escalating crisis. And shoring up ties with China, as German Chancellor Olaf Scholz kickstarts his trip to the country in the southwestern city of Chongqing. Iran has threatened a much larger response if there is any retaliation for its mass drone and missile attack on Israeli territory overnight. Israel warns the campaign is not over yet after its military and allies intercepted hundreds of Iranian projectiles. The IDF confirmed a small number of hits, including at a military base in southern Israel where a child was injured. Alex Cadier is our correspondent in Tel Aviv. Alex, a tense night across the region. What have we heard from the Israeli government? Will there be a response? Well, there will be, certainly be some kind of response, but what kind of response, Paul, is really the big question here. Now, we know Prime Minister Netanyahu is convening the war cabinet. Let's bring you the view uh, from one member of that war cabinet. You have Gallant. He is the defence uh, minister. He gave an assessment of how he sees uh, the next couple of days unfolding. Let's have a listen to what he had to say. This campaign is not over yet. We need to remain prepared and attentive to the IDF and Home Front Command's instructions and to prepare for any scenario. At the same time, we blocked the first wave and we did it with great success. Well, the home front instructions that uh, Minister Gallant just mentioned there remain unchanged. Schools across Israel staying closed until the end of Monday. But also you have Gallant going a little bit further when he was at an air defense battery in Israel earlier today saying that uh, the attack by Iran presents an opportunity to create a coalition, an alliance to deal with the Iranian threat. That would be a regional alliance. Now, that would also indicate uh, that that would not mean a direct retaliatory military response on Iranian soil in the next few days or in the next few hours. We heard from another member of the war cabinet, Benny Gantz, former defense minister, saying that Israel will respond, quote, at a time that suits us. We will build a regional coalition and exact a price from Iran. But that also would suggest not seeing an immediate retaliation from Israel. Now, that would be what the United States, what China, what, what other world powers are calling for, de-escalation, not uh, uh, running head, head first towards a war with Iran, a war between Israel and Iran, two nuclear-capable countries. So the indications from some members of the war cabinet is that that retaliation could be built up through a regional coalition uh, to further isolate and punish Iran. But, of course, we haven't heard from the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yet on what the final decision will be because he will be under political pressure. We know that the National Security Minister, who is not in the War Cabinet, Itamar Ben-Gavir, says that there is, it is now time for a response to Iran that is not proportional. We heard a similar uh, tone struck by the Finance Minister Betzalel Smotrich, the two more extreme members of Prime Minister Netanyahu's government. So we'll have to wait and see for the next few hours what that decision will be, Paul. Right. And Alex, how does Hezbollah and Lebanon fit into this? Israel has stepped up its attacks in Lebanon against Hezbollah. How does that fit in? Well, that could be another uh, alternative, a parallel retaliation, if you were. Now, there have been a, there's been a simmering conflict between Hezbollah and Israel for the last few weeks. There's no question about that uh, being often called a shadow war between uh, Iran's proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, who, of course, committed the atrocities on October 7th, uh, and the Israeli forces. Now, there could be retaliation on those proxies, including the Houthi rebels in Yemen, rather than directly onto Iran. That would be another path to avoiding escalation. We know that just today the Israeli Air Force struck very deep into Lebanese territory, destroying what they described as an ammunition production uh, center for Hezbollah. So, again, you'll have to monitor all these situations very cl cl uh, closely, and we will be here on the ground doing that for you. But there is a risk still of escalation with Iran because the Iranian government has said very clearly if Israel were to hit back, were to strike back, 
Despite the advice of its allies, the response from Iran will be even more severe than the tense, sleepless and quite dangerous night Israel had last night. Alex, thanks so much for that. Alex Cadier reporting from Tel Aviv. Well, let's get more now on the Americans and their approach to this. Jim Spelman is our correspondent in Washington, D.C. Jim, what's the latest we've heard from the Biden administration? They seem to be very clearly stating they do not want this to escalate. Yeah, it's been a busy weekend at the White House. We've just received word from the White House in the last few minutes that a call, a secure video call with President Biden and the other leaders of the G7 countries has wrapped up in that call, those seven nations uh, reaffirming their support for Israel's security. If we step back to yesterday, President Biden was at his beach house in the neighboring state of Delaware. He planned to be there all weekend. Uh, as these uh, attacks started to unfold, he came back to the White House, conferred with his national security team, and then he spoke on the phone with the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, while uh, expressing his, as he put it, ironclad support uh, for the security of Israel. He also encouraged the Prime Minister to show restraint in responding to these attacks, suggesting perhaps that the successful air defense of most of these missiles and, and uh, drones uh, was in itself uh, a mark of success by Israel in this. President Biden is facing challenges over this here at home with hawks uh, on Capitol Hill pushing for a more severe military reaction to Iran, where there are progressives in his own Democratic Party as we head towards elections that are encouraging him to call for restraint on all sides and, in fact, to push uh, Israel to end the ongoing challenge, the ongoing conflict in Gaza. So President Biden weighing a lot of different concerns here uh, moving forward, but making two things clear. One, that that the U.S. supports Israel, and two, that the U.S. wants Israel to show restraint in responding to these air attacks from Iran. Paul? And Jim, what about the United Nations? The U.N. Security Council is set to meet for emergency talks. How could that change the situation, if at all? Yeah, we expect them to meet in about four hours. This meeting coming at the request of the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. And what Israel wants are two things. One, wants the Security Council to condemn the attacks by Iran and also wants the Security Council to de designate Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Uh, Unlikely that that second thing is going to happen, certainly not likely to happen today. There may be some sort of vague condemnation of the attack. But so far, throughout the current wave of challenges in the Middle East, it's been difficult for the Security uh, Council to come to any kind of consensus on these issues. Hard to imagine today being the day when they do, Paul. Okay, Jim, thanks so much for that. Jim Spellman reporting from D.C. Well, Iran says it has not ruled out another military operation if Israel commits aggression against it. Iran also told the U.S. not to back any counterattacks from Israel. Essen Kavani is our correspondent in Tehran. Uh, the IRGC has warned the U.S. against any support for uh, the participation uh, in possible attacks on Iran's interests. Uh, Iran says if the U.S. Uh, intervenes and helps Tel Aviv for a possible counterattack, uh, the American bases in the region will be targeted. Uh, we should pay attention that uh, the countries that host U.S. military bases in the region do not have uh, that much advanced uh, air defense systems. And if attacked by Iran, uh, the chances of heavy casualties for uh, the U.S. Uh, are high. Well, on Saturday night, uh, immediately after the attack, we were in Palestine Square in Tehran, uh, talking to people who had gathered there uh, to celebrate. Uh, here is what some had to say there. As you know, a few weeks after our forces were murdered by Israel in the Iranian consulate, and after our leaders' warning that Israel would be punished and its aggression would not go unanswered, Iran attack Israel tonight and strikes against Israel continue. We would like to tell Israel that we are always present and never leave the field. We support our leader, we support the IRGC, and we support the army. We saw such celebrations in many other cities across Iran, and similar gatherings are expected on Sunday evening uh, as well. Uh, many Iranian people are really worried that uh, the consequences of these tensions could lead to 
uh, more economic pressure as they now face uh, an inflation rate of at least 50 percent. Essan Kivani in Tehran. Meanwhile, European leaders are scrambling to prevent what could be a dangerous escalation to the conflict in the Middle East. Let's go to our correspondent, Trent Murray, in Berlin. Trent, Iran has summoned the British, French and German ambassadors. How does Tehran view their involvement in all this? Yeah, that's right, uh, Paul. We understand the three ambassadors from those countries were given a diplomatic dressing down in Tehran over what... The state news agency there is reporting as double standards and an irresponsible stance to the condemnations that has come not just from those three countries but really across much of the European continent. They say that those double standards reflect a, a different policy approach, if you will, to how Europe reacted to that strike on April 1 on IRGC members at the Iranian consulate in Damascus. And so we know uh, that they are certainly viewing this from Tehran as retaliation for that strike on their diplomatic premises in Damascus. Um, we are just also tracking some further updates that we've received in the past 30 minutes or so, because we understand Lord Cameron of the United Kingdom, presumably following that diplomatic dressing down with the British ambassador, well, he has now spoken with the Iranian foreign minister, uh, where he has posted online uh, that he has condemned in the strongest terms Israel's attack on Israel. A similar point of view we are hearing from Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President. She has also posted only in the past 10 minutes or so on X, formerly known as Twitter, that today alongside other G7 leaders, they've just had a meeting, we understand, a video conference meeting, those G7 countries plus the EU. Uh, well, she said that, that she condemned Iran's unprecedented attack against Israel in the strongest terms. But crucially, uh, she said and like many other of the statements we are tracking today, that they are calling for restraint in order to make sure that this doesn't spiral out of control into a wider war uh, across the region. We understand that too was the topic of conversation earlier today when the EU's top diplomat, Joseph Burrell, spoke with his Iranian counterpart, again condemning what, what took place last night in Israel, but also calling for restraint to be exercised, Paul. Trent Murray in Berlin, many thanks. China has called on relevant parties to exercise calm and restraint to prevent further escalations in the Middle East. Beijing says the Iranian strike on Israel is the latest spillover from conflicts between Israel and Palestine. It also is suggested the priority is to implement the recent UN resolution on Gaza to ease tension in the region. Our correspondent Akram al Sattari is in Rafah in Gaza. Well, thousands of Palestinians have been trying to cross from the southern Gaza to the northern Gaza. The whole thing started when a very limited number of Palestinians managed to cross from the very critical area of Nitzarim, like the area that is across from Nitzarim in Shahr al Rasid, al Rashid Street area, and they managed to enter into the territory that was divided by the Israeli occupation army. Then they were communicating with their relatives and with their friends, and they were telling them that they managed to enter the area. It looks like the area was not that heavily guarded by the Israeli tanks and by the Israeli troops that were deployed along the area in that particular place. So hundreds of families started to go to that area. Tens of them managed to enter. Then the Israeli tanks came to that area. They were besieging the people. They were shooting at the people. Then the Israeli Apaches, the helicopters, were shooting at the people and the tanks themselves were throwing uh, gas canisters onto the people, trying to deter them and stop them from going further into the area. Journalists were there documenting everything that was happening and filming the fact that people were managing to enter to the Gaza North. Palestinians were cherishing that moment and they're hopeful that they would be able to cross. Thousands of them were faced by the Israeli on going fire. At least six of them were killed and dozens more were injured. And up to this particular moment, the, uh, uh, the Israeli fighter jets are breaking the sound barrier and also to deter the people and the tanks are shooting and also the artillery fire is all over the area for the sake of stopping the thousands of Palestinians from coming back to their homes in the northern Gaza. And Akram, Hamas has issued its response to a ceasefire proposal overnight. What do we know? Hamas is still insisting they would not accept a ceasefire unless the four conditions that were laid in the very 
uh, in the very beginning of the discussion, March 14, they want full withdrawal of the Israeli army from the Gaza Strip. They want full stoppage of the war. They want unhindered access of a humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip and full rebuilding of the Gaza Strip. And they want a decent and appropriate a prisoner a swap deal with the Israeli occupation. And they have made it very clear those conditions were not met. The Israeli, the Israeli side is not interested in just fulfilling those requirements. And it looks like, as they said, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is buying himself time for some internal dynamics and issues. So they said they will not accept a deal unless that deal or any other deal in the future would respect and observe those four, four different conditions. That was our Gaza correspondent, Akram al Satari. Well, let's get some more analysis on all of this with Simon Maben, who is a professor of international politics at Lancaster University here in the UK. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Simon. So if we take a step back Thank for you. a moment, could we say that this really is a moment of maximum danger, the most dangerous moment since the war began in terms of the international spillover? Yeah, I, I think so. In light of how everything has played out over the past six months or so, this is the point where Iran has been most directly involved, where the U.S. appears to be on the brink of being pulled into something. The international community appears to be uh, taking sides in all of this if it hasn't already done so. It's a very precarious moment, and I think in light of all of these shifts, the increasing involvement of Hezbollah, the Iraqi militias, and now direct um, missile and drone attacks from Iranian territory. It's a very precarious moment. And we have uh, the United States saying they really want to press a diplomatic response, the G7 meeting right now at the moment. Um, what kind of pressure can ensure that the Israelis do hold back from a direct retaliation? Could that be stopped? Yeah, I mean, I think... Those in the know would say that if Mr. Biden wanted to stop it, he could stop it. But that wouldn't necessarily be the most palatable to him right now, politically, in light of it being an election year. And he would have to expend quite a good amount of political capital putting pressure on Mr. Netanyahu to, to stop. That being said, I do not believe that the U.S. wants this to escalate further. We know that Mr. Biden and Mr. Netanyahu have had a fraught relationship, but maybe this is a chance for the U.S. to reassert some type of leadership over global politics, if indeed that's what it wants to do. So I think it is an important moment for the U.S., and it's an important moment for the Middle East as well. And what about other countries, including the U.K.? We had the RAF, the Royal Air Force, involved. Uh, Britain's ex-ambassador Tehran saying that this is not our fight. To what extent are other Western countries getting embroiled in this? Well, they appear to be getting embroiled in, in rather strange ways and rather surprising ways. Uh, when, we, when we woke to the news about what had happened last night, it then started to trickle out that British, American and French planes were involved in the shooting down of these missiles and the drones. It later had rumors that Jordanians and the Saudis were involved in this as well. So there seems to have been some wide scale collaboration and communication to make sure that this did not lead to a devastating attack on Israel. So I think there is always a chance that things would escalate. But in saying that, there's also the involvement of a large number of states who do not want this to escalate. And I think the fact that the British, the French and the Americans were involved last night shows that they do not want it to escalate because if there was a big hit on Israel that would lead to a dramatic retaliation. And briefly, Simon, what do we think is going to happen next? What is the most likely course of action Israel's likely to take? They're talking about this regional alliance. Does that suggest there is not going to be an immediate military response to Iran? I certainly hope there wasn't immediate response to Iran. I think the cabinet is meeting in Israel right now, and the US and the UN will be putting on a lot of pressure to try and prevent any further escalation. Thank you so much, Simon. Simon Maben from the University of Lancaster. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has arrived in Chongqing, the start of his three-day visit to China, which runs through to Tuesday. Scholz is leading a business delegation with the two countries' trade issues topping the agenda. This is his second visit to China since taking office. He will head to Shanghai on Monday after visiting Chongqing.
And our correspondent Zheng Sung Wu is in Chongqing with the latest. German Chancellor Oliver Scholz uh, arrived in Chongqing's Jiangbei International Airport quite early this morning, around 10 to 8 o'clock. And his first stop in Chongqing was a company that specializes in the uh, development and, and the production of the hydrogen uh, powertrain products. And uh, um, Mr. Chancellor and his delegation spent about an hour in the company, and the head of the company showcased some products such as heavy tracks using uh, hydrogen as a fuel to them. And uh, uh, Chancellor um, Oliver Schultz was quite interested in the uh, uh, high-tech machines in the manufacturing shops, and he even tried hard to use a drill to get a screw turn. And uh, in the afternoon, I believe uh, Mr. Chancellor had a, a really good, a great time because he had a city walk in the center of uh, Chongqing, and it was really brilliant to see that thousands of uh, tourists and uh, residents uh, in the city was so excited to see uh, Mr. Chancellor in Chongqing, and uh, in return, uh, Olive Schultz also said hello to them. It's uh, the second time that uh, Oliver Schultz uh, visited in China, and uh, uh, as he, since he was elected uh, uh, German, German Chancellor, and uh, you know uh, the frequent visits tell that Germany and China are always good partners, and. For China, Germany has been the largest trader partner in Europe for uh, 89 consecutive years. And for Germany, China also has been the largest uh, trader partner for uh, eight consecutive years. So cooperation and uh, uh, good relationships between the two big economies in the world always benefit the people as well as the world. And uh, in the next two days, um, well... Uh, Oliver Schultz will soon finish his visit in Chongqing, and in the next two days, he will also visit Shanghai and Beijing. China is opening up, encouraging foreigners to come and visit with the offer of visa-free travel. CGTN Europe launches a special series, Flying Free, looking into how the policy could impact tourism and business between Europe and China. Our correspondent, Hermione Kitson, reports now from Rome. Giovanni Mazze's family has been in the winemaking business in the heart of Tuscany's Chianti Classico region since 1435. And he says passion is the key to centuries of success. So I can say that we've been devoted for over 25 generations to the Sangiovese and to the uh, territory. China is one of the brand's top 10 export markets. And before the pandemic, 50,000 bottles were sent there each year. We invest a lot in the market. I used to live in Asia, in Hong Kong, and I used to develop, I started developing China myself. So I think the fact that we're spending more time there, it really helped us to understand more and to know more of the Chinese culture. Livio Mazzanti is the brand's China area manager. He says they're yet to return to 2019 numbers, but that China's visa-free travel initiative will improve business as it will cut paperwork and lengthy processing times. The Chinese government uh, introduced a good strategy because for us it's much, much easier to go to China because we can take the, the first flight available. I think it's a great benefit. Um, and I think we will see big returns from this. Italy is among 11 European countries involved in the trial of 15 days of visa-free travel to China. The last four should be added to the list include Austria, Belgium, Hungary and Luxembourg. It's hoped simplifying travel to China will not only boost business but also tourism. Last year there was a surge in interest in China as a holiday destination and now there are currently 35 flights per week from Rome to nine different destinations. Authorities at Rome's Fiumicino Airport believe 2024 will be a record year for Chinese travel. Now, at the beginning of 2024, in uh, the period between January and February, we are strongly growing uh, compared to 2019 levels, and we got a plus 60% in terms of uh, seats offered, capacity offered. The one-year trial is expected to end in November. Hermione Kitson, CGTN, Rome. Sunday marks the final day of the Paris Book Fair, a chance for publishers, authors and booksellers to showcase their work to the world. 
As our correspondent Ross Cullen reports, this year's edition saw a strong Chinese presence. From prose writers to philosophers, poets and dramatists, France's writers are internationally renowned and the national love of literature was on show at this year's Paris Book Fair. It's a festival of culture and reading with book signings and writing workshops. There are many different nationalities represented at the fair. One of the overseas stands celebrated Chinese literature. Author Ye Mi explained why she has focused her work on the story of women in China. Because after China's reforms and opening up, women's economic status is improving and their awareness of their own independence is strengthening. Also, when I wrote this novel, I was going through menopause and I felt that I should write about a woman. This was a gift to myself. Like France, China also has a rich literary tradition, from lyric poetry to drama and fiction. Some of the country's top authors were invited to the fair. What is described in this novel is actually a very contemporary small village in China. It was originally a traditional farming village, and now it has become a cultural tourism-type village. In small places, the changes in people's emotions, moral changes and changes in human nature between neighbors are very interesting. The book fair does not just celebrate publications, but also the art of writing in French. Dictation is a classic elementary school test, and a mass spelling exercise took place as part of the three-day event. Mixing politics and literature is common in France. Former President Nicolas Sarkozy, far-right figurehead Marine Le Pen, and the current finance minister Bruno Le Maire are just some of the politicians who are also published authors. Despite the popularity of podcasts and the success of e-books and audiobooks, the French are still committed consumers of stories told in hard copies. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. And a final look at our headlines. Iran attacks Israel for the first time ever, firing hundreds of drones and missiles. Israel says the confrontation is not over yet. Meanwhile, celebrations in Tehran, but anxiety in the West. World leaders urge restraints in the face of a rapidly escalating crisis. And shoring up ties with China, as German Chancellor Olaf Scholz kickstarts his trip to the country in the southwestern city of Chongqing. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. There's more news on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app, or you can scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. There's more news at the top of the hour coming up next. It's Razor. For now, from all the team in London, goodbye.